adapt and overcome, like get over it, like embrace the harsh reality. It's gone. You're not going to the gym. Stop the woe is me. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Adapt and overcome. It's what every single elite athlete has had to do at some point in their career. You are not special because your routine doesn't get to exist anymore. This is everyone is in the same boat. And even if they weren't, if it was just you, it's your turn to adapt and overcome. Never allow yourself in a moment to think, woe is me, to think like, oh, I don't have my routine. Oh, I can't do this. Like, just get over it and do what you can with what you got for where you are right now. We are here because we know the outcomes in our lives are within our control. That taking absolute ownership of how we eat, sleep, train, think, and connect with each other is how we'll optimize our health and happiness. That chasing excellence is how we grab hold of what is possible. Our mission is to live on the run, always chasing, never stopping. Hello and welcome back to another remote edition of Chasing Excellence. How are you, Ben? I'm good, Patrick. Thanks. Today we are going to talk about uh, the athletic side, the competitive side uh, of, uh, or rather the the how everything that's going on is affecting the competitive side and the athletic side right. that you spent so much time uh, working with. Um, we've talked about a little bit in a, in a two minute drill, you know, we've, uh, somebody asked about your thoughts on whether there should be a CrossFit games and then maybe what that looks like. And so, um, th- that notwithstanding, like, I don't think we have to get into the kind of the guessing game of that, but I'm really curious about guessing game is so fun though. Pat. I know it is, but, um, yes. I'm really curious about how you, the, the team at comp train, the, at your athletes, um, are one, just kind of like thinking about everything that's going on, responding to all of the unknowns and all the uncertainty and then kind of maybe segue into like, how are you guys preparing for this, this unknown element now? Like before, like we all thought we knew when the games was going to be. Yeah. Now we think maybe it's September, but who even knows about that? So like just kind of catch us all up on everything that you, you guys have been doing, working on thinking about as it, as it relates to just this competitive season. Yeah. So, um, so there's basically two different sides to what comp train is. <clears throat> there's comp train, which we uh, program for the masses and there's pro- comp train, which I program uh, specifically for a few elite athletes, most likely, uh, most namely, um, Catherine David's daughter, Brooke Wells, Cole Sager. We also work with Amanda Barnhart, Sam Quant. Um, but, um, the, the way those athletes, um, that are pre- preparing to try to, you know, essentially be top 10 on the podium and win the CrossFit games, it's very specific to the CrossFit games themselves. Yeah. And because of that, what we're trying to do is actually peak. I mean, it's like no other, it's like any other sport, right? You, if you know, you have to be your absolute best when you're going to run for that gold medal, hundred yard, hundred meter dash. So we're trying to get them to their absolute best. And there's a science to that. There's a science to getting people up to the as fittest as they've ever been at a specific point in time. What you're alluding to is this challenge, which we don't know what that specific time is right yeah. now. So, it, it brings another level of complexity, uh, complexity and another level of, um, unknown to, to what we're trying to do. It makes it kind of fun, honestly. Um, cause it's truly now we're back to this. I always, I always revert back to the beginning of the early days of CrossFit, which is the unknown and the unknowable, right? It's, it's what we, our sport's supposed to be. It's what we're supposed to be training for is this is another level of the unknown. It's like, it's kind of cool. Like we don't know if we're going to be, have the games at all. And if you don't have the games at all, your, your training program looks very different, right? Cause now you're trying, you have a much longer runway to try to peak for the end of July in 2001. Yeah. So that's very different. Well, what if the games are in the first week of August? Well, that's gonna be very different than if they're first week of September or October or some other time. So, um, it brings into, uh, brings extra variables into the equation. What we are trying to do is, uh, you know, you talked, we talked about guessing in the beginning of this thing. Um, we're trying to take our best guess, but also set ourselves up so we're not putting all chips into one. Um, what's the right same thing to say there? All chips into one bucket, or I'm definitely mixing analogies there. <laughs> all um, eggs in one basket. Yes, yeah, all yeah. Put all your yes. That. Put all your chickens um, in one basket. <laughs> yeah. Um, so essentially, what we're doing is kind of game planning for the most likely scenario, which I think is probably what we know right now is something along the lines of. A limited field of athletes get invited to compete at Aromas in September. 
Yep. Like that's kind of like our best guess. And we're using that as our um, default program, but we're also keeping some um, some other things in. So th- what, first off, what that changes is it, it basically adds another um, four to six weeks of uh, the training season. Yep. So we're going to be four to six weeks behind where we'd otherwise normally be on purpose. When I say behind, that doesn't mean like we're doing – we're, um, we're not as fit. It means basically you have more time to build foundation, more time to build base endurance, more time to work on skills, more time to work on strength. Yep. Towards the, we get close to the games, basically you're peaking your fitness out. You just got to get your, your, your engine up to its, to its max. And when you do that, you're not able to work on a lot of the other aspects of the sport, which take longer to develop. So the really long answer to your pretty simple question is uh, we are um, we're, we're basically just pushing the whole thing out another month to month and a half mm-hmm. um, and allowing ourselves a little more time to work on a little more of the early season stuff than we would be at this point. It's kind of weird because if we're talking like this uh, maybe two – I guess it's two years ago, maybe three years ago, um, we'd be at regionals right now. Mm. This would be regionals. Yep. So now we have these two things, which is regionals don't exist as of last year. Yep. And right now, like no one knows where they're supposed to be in terms of fitness at all. The nice part about regionals was it created, a, you know, when open regionals games, each one of those was two months apart. It gave you a really systematic approach to how to the season. Everyone got very comfortable of knowing how fit they were supposed to be at certain points. It, it was like real, um, triggers, real, um, um, bright lights in terms of like, now you're going to switch gears to this yep. and now you're going to switch gears to this. Well, that went away when they took away the, the, the kind of known formatting of the games off season, open regionals games. And now this year that's gone as well as we don't know when the games are mm-hmm. and no one's training together at all. So it's kind of, you have this other kind of unknown in terms of like, well, how fit am I right now? And yeah. what should I be working on? How do you know? Because that's an interesting point. The the check marks on the calendar, like, okay, we're, we're where we're supposed to be. How do you, how are you guys trying to figure out, like, okay, how how can we get as close to that as we possibly can, given all those unknowns? Is that, do you just let that go as part of the process now? Or are you figuring out in some way, like, okay, we've got to figure out where where we think we should be on August 1st or whatever. Yeah. Uh, the latter, you got to kind of figure out where you think you're supposed to be. You can't just kind of like free will willy nilly this thing. I mean, you could, right. But if you did, um, that's essentially the free willy nilly thing is like, we're just going to kind of be, that's the constant ready state. Yep. And that's what CrossFit is. You're just like, you're constantly ready to go. Um, at any point you are your fittest. That's phenomenal for everyday life. Because you don't know when you don't know when the day is you're gonna have to rescue someone from a burning building. You don't know when the day is um, that your buddy's gonna ask you to play pickup basketball. You don't know when the day is that you're gonna um, get hit by a car and your your fitness, your wellness is gonna be the thing that saves you. So you have to be in this constant ready state. These elite athletes don't operate that way. There's an off season. There's a there's a base building. There's um, a taper and a peak. So what we need to do is try to figure out where in this um, loosey-goosey system, this unknown, where do we think we are right now? And you're trying to basically take your best guess as to where that is. And we don't have the – so the honest answer to this is um, Cole's in a different spot than Cat is and Cat's Mm -hmm. in a different spot than Brooke is. I don't know if they know that. (laughs) (laughs) They do now. Yeah. (laughs) Um, it strikes me like one of the things we talk about a lot, um, just in general here, but also specific to the the athlete side is the, 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 the thinking about the defining, the focusing on those, those few things within, uh, our control within your athlete's control and the many, many things outside of the control. And obviously we're in a, uh, I was thinking earlier today, like the, the ability to, to distinguish those things within your control and, and everything else is kind of like the meta skill that everybody is being forced to learn right now. Some, some of us better than others. Um, but I was thinking specifically about your athletes. Like, is this going to be, do you hope this is going to be a 
competitive advantage that they have whenever the games do happen, given that this is something that you, that this time is not withstand, like this isn't, this is different, obviously, but this is not something that you guys haven't thought about. You haven't trained with, you haven't talked about quite a bit in the years that things went great and the years that things didn't go great. Is this because of so much uncertainty is, are the athletes who are going to be able to best focus on those few things going to have a competitive advantage this year Whereas they might not have as much of an advantage any other year if things were, were quote unquote normal. If this thing happened five years ago, this would be a massive competitive advantage. Mm. The field has matured a lot. I don't believe that um, any one of my athletes who's competing against the top 10 in the world is going to gain a competitive advantage out of this because at this point, the sport is matured enough that everyone kind of at least understands that principle. Mm-hmm. Um, people can put into practice and execute it better than others. And they'll gain, they'll, they'll, they'll gain some sort of advantage potentially out of that. But at large CrossFit is, is maturing a lot and everyone kind of understands, um, this idea that if you're focusing a lot of things that are outside your control, you're kind of like burning up matchsticks that you're not going to get back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what, where have you guys, well, two, First question is like how quickly from a from a coach perspective and maybe from a comp train perspective, how quickly did you guys realize that the season was like was being flipped upside down? And and like how did you guys as a team start to develop that plan or the plan that you've kind of got in place to to start to adjust to this unknown timeline, given that time is such an important factor in programming out for the for the games? Um, I would say it was probably when, uh, I can actually give it probably pretty specific is probably when, um, the Madrid championship didn't happen. Yep. So, um, West, West coast, um, was coming up when this whole thing went down and it seemed really unlikely that that was going to happen because it was right in the midst of what we all thought was gonna be a two week shutdown and this thing would pass by. (laughs) Um, but all of a sudden there was like, well, no, like this thing's going to be like, um, really kind of quickly it shifted towards Madrid, which was, uh, essentially kind of like coming up in a couple of weeks, actually, I think it was in mid May. Mm-hmm. And we we're like, Oh, this is going to, this could potentially change the landscape of what this whole thing looks like a lot. And then really specifically is when the Olympics, um, canceled mm-hmm. yep. when the Olympics canceled, if that, not to say that the CrossFit games are on the scale of the Olympics, but it's the same type of thing, right? Athletes from all over the world coming in to an athlete village, essentially with vendors and spectators, lots of media. It's this big, um, and when that, and that closed down pretty early, uh, they, they, they postponed that. Now the advantage that the the Olympics has is that they can postpone. Mm -hmm. So they can do this next year. The CrossFit games can't postpone because they got to name 2021's CrossFit games champion. This is a every year thing. So it's not like you can postpone, um, the world series. Cause you have next year's world series. You can't postpone it to the next year. Yep. So it's the challenge that, uh, is a little bit more unique to, to CrossFit, um, that they got to try to get this thing in before the end of the calendar year. And honestly, like, I, I think that they're, they'd probably have a hard time readjusting the open, which is in October. Mm. So essentially they put the start of next season as a fixed thing which is October. Yeah. So they kind of got to squeeze this thing in between now. That's why I say September yep. between now and September. So September is the latest that they can go. That's why we're kind of using the game plan that as our, um, as our most likely case scenario. Yeah. Um, I want to get into kind of talking about, uh, athletes who are still training, um, but perhaps maybe not training for the CrossFit Games specifically. But before I do, um, we definitely got some questions from folks looking for your opinion on the recent announcements that like that the Masters weren't going to be competing this year or or the Masters and the teens, yep. the, the age groupers, um, were not going to have a place at the CrossFit Games this year. Do you have um, anything to say, not about that, but maybe to those athletes who found themselves suddenly without a – uh, without that goalpost that they thought that they were going to be aiming for. And now it's kind of like they've just been taken yeah. away entirely. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll speak to the kind of my thoughts on that and then I'll speak to, um, so I love the master's athletes. We have, uh, we have over a dozen master's athletes at CrossFit New England that qualify for the age group qualifier every year. Like yeah. it's a 
massive part of our community. We had, um, um, Emma was one of our teenagers yeah. that qualified for the games this year. It's like, it's a, um, it's a big part of who we are on, comp, on the comp train side. We have, I mean, we started as a master's program. That's yeah. the ethos of who we are. That's like, it is a massive part of our community and, uh, who we are. Um, you know, I, I feel for those guys at the same time. I'm, I'm, I could not be less surprised. Mm -hmm. Like when you think about the, the challenges that the, that HQ is facing in terms of this, um, like there's not, I would be shocked if there's a team competition as well. Yeah. Like, and I love the teams. We won the team affiliate cup. Like it's not because I don't like it. It's just like, I'm so ultimately surprised. And this just goes back to one of our principles is like, embrace harsh realities. Like, don't be an eternal optimist. Like it's going to work out for us. It'll happen. It'll happen. It'll happen. You're going to get your heart broken. Mm. Be an extreme realist. Like we talk about this all the time. Like what's the most likely case scenario? Okay. Now let's prepare for that. Prepare for, and prepare for it emotionally before it happens. Yeah. Then all of a sudden you're expecting adversity and you're expecting to overcome it. So that's what I would encourage all of my masters and age group, um, and, um, team, with an M yep. for, um, followers and athletes to, to have done before this is to prepare yourself for that very likely scenario that you're not gonna have a games, like mm -hmm. get yourself emotionally prepared for that beforehand. So it's not, you're not rocked. Yep. Get yourself just like we do with the games, get yourself pre prepared beforehand for being in dead last after the first event. like be ready for that. Okay. Now that you're ready for that, when it happens, like no big deal. Mm -hmm. and if it doesn't happen, great. Awesome. Amazing. Like it's better than we expected. Yep. Okay. It's not a matter of like visualizing negativity. That's where people get this thing wrong. I'm not saying visualize negativity. I'm saying have a contingency plan for everything mm -hmm. from there. Then when you're walking on the floor, visualize success. That's what it means. Now, in terms of what I would suggest for those athletes going forward, the faster and the people that adapt the quickest will become out of this thing the best. What this has allowed you to do is now you have a essentially, you know, a 15 month training program for next year's games. Yeah. Like instead of what everyone what you would have had. Now is the chance, more so than ever, if you had gone to the games, what you need to do is what we just talked about. You'd have to spend this time peaking, getting incredibly fit. And I use the word fit for like metabolic conditioning, like cross, cross fits, good mm -hmm. at thrusters and pull-ups and heart rate of 185 and still be able to cycle a barbell and run and all that stuff. What you can do now is take a step back, analyze yourself today, this season, and then from there, identify your weaknesses and then smash them. Like you have, you now have a chance to really, which you would not have had. The way this thing is set up now, you would have gone to the games Okay, you would have gone to the games. You would have had to retake the whole month of August to recover. Cool. September starts. You're just getting back in the gym. And guess what happens in October? Three weeks later, yep. the Open. You're qualifying for the games again. Well, realize that. Now you have another shot, a really good shot, of setting yourself up for next year. Mm -hmm. Probably in a little bit better of a position than you might have been in this year. Mm -hmm. And if you're like, no, this is my chance because I just aged up. I was in the youngest in my age group. Okay, so you can either focus and woe on the negative Go ahead, be the person that always looks for the negative in every situation, and you will see more negative. Frequency illusion, it's one of the major biases we have in life, is if you tell you to look it for the red cars, you will see more red cars. If you look for the negative, you will see it. If you look for the opportunity, which is what I just alluded to, more time to hone your weaknesses and actually forge some mental or physical things that might not, might have held you back this year, well, now all of a sudden, you're looking for the blue cars. You're looking for opportunity. You will see more of them. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's get into maybe some of the nitty gritty of what um, athletes are dealing with, experiencing right now. Well, one of the questions I, I was curious about is is your opinion on whether or not an athlete uh, – and so obviously in this conversation when I say an athlete, I mean like the comp trainers, the folks who are doing yeah. double days and all that. Um, yeah. Okay. Competitors. Competitors. Yeah. 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 Um, assuming that some number of them uh, – are obviously locked out of their gym. They're still training, but maybe at, at with less equipment, less um, yeah. flexibility, less whatever uh, that they're used to. Um, should they assume, should they go into this process or come out of this process kind of with the assumption that like, I'm going to lose some of the progress that I made. And that's just the reality of this, the situation. I'm not going to beat myself up over it too much. Or 
is that an is that a is that a, 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 a an erroneous assumption on my, my part? And in fact, that you don't believe that people should be, uh, you know, losing progress just because of this. Erroneous. Erroneous. It's, it's a, erroneous. <laughs> erroneous on all accounts. That's a quote from a movie. I can't tell you what movie it's from. I just know that. <laughs> I love it. Do you know what it is? No, I have no idea. Yeah. But it's definitely a you're not a movie, movie guy. I need I need somebody to like bounce movie. I, I am a movie guy. I just have a terrible memory, so I don't remember quotes. I, I have a terrible memory. I can only remember quotes from movies, <laughs> except for this one, obviously. Okay. Um, should they? Um, is is it an erroneous assumption that they're going to in this lockdown period yeah. they're going to lose capacity in some form or sense? No, it is not. And now people are going to go. Well, yes, it is. Like, yes, I'm not. I can't hold my fitness. Yeah, I didn't say that. So what you want to be able to do is like give yourself um, a score, like a competitor score. And what we'll do is we'll rank 10 categories, one to 10. So the first one's your endurance, like going long, like Mm -hmm. 5K is the minimum, right? So we're talking like five to 10K runs. We're talking um, um, 10K to marathon rows. We're talking um, Murph or longer Um, We're talking like ruck runs, those type of things. So endurance, okay? And then we'll break down 10 other categories. So now you have um, stamina. So think muscle fatigue, like 100 pull-ups for time, 100 push-ups for time. Like think not things that take heart rate or strength, but muscle fatigue, okay? So like um, usually that's what like like toes to bars give up for most people. Uh, Then we'll take um, some skills, like like double unders, muscle-ups, handstand walking. Okay, we'll put like a score – Rank yourself one to 10 on 10 different things. Yep. What you'll find is you'll give yourself a score. And if you're a really good competitor, you might be in like the 70s, right? Let's say you're a seven across the board. That'd be a very competitive athlete. Well, some of those things, you might be a three or a four. And other things, you might be a nine or a 10. Here's what's going to happen in this period. The nines or the tens have a very likelihood that they might drop down a little bit. That's okay. What you want to do during this period is bring up the threes or the fours. This is actually your time to work on specificity Mm. because what's gone is the variance we were once playing with. That variable in our program has been taken off the platform or other things. Maybe you don't have rings, so you can't do that. Or um, you no longer have the time because you now have to homeschool your kids or you don't have this or that. I get it. You have limited resources, whether it's equipment, time, or whatever it might be. Because of that, what you should be doing is using this as a time to lean into your weakest link. And what will happen is you will, your eight or your nine will drop down to a seven. But the goal is to bring up your four also to a seven. Then when you come out of this, your seven's across the board again still, so you have lost zero capacity. Mm -hmm. Except what you have done is brought up your weakest link. Now when you get back, the easiest thing to improve because it's a real thing, it's called muscle memory, is your strength. Everyone can bring up their, when I say strength, I don't mean like how much you can lift, it's a, is their wheelhouse, mm-hmm. their, their, yep. uh, their, their best thing. It's, um, it's, so, it's easier to bring up your best thing back to its best thing than it is to bring up something you suck at for a long time. So let's take a specific thing here. Let's say you have an athlete that um, is strong, right? They have a, uh, a, a 485 back squat, they snatch 300 pounds. They clean and jerk 345. Um, but their um, endurance is bad. Okay, so they their um, their one mile run is uh, um, 645, and their 5K is uh, 24 minutes. Yep. Uh, on the games level, that's terrible. The strength numbers are totally fine. You're going to be at a, a top 10 number in every strength number that we look at. You're going to be totally fine. Um, but your endurance is a one or two. You're going to come in dead last in some of those events. So what this athlete's going to do during quarantine, during this lockdown, is they're going to take a step away from the weights. That's going to drop down to a seven because now their clean and jerk is going to go from a 345 to a 330. Still competitive. Their snatch is going to go from 300 pounds to 285. And their back squats can go from 485 to 455. Cool. You are still on the, up, on the upper half of those strength numbers for a games athlete. Then from there, we're going to get their mile time from whatever I said, 645 or whatever I said, 640. We're going to get that down to a 555. So you're in the mix. Like that's just in the mix for these guys. Mm -hmm. But you're at least middle of the pack. Now you're a five or a six there. 
So now what we do is when we come out of this quarantine lockdown period, you're going to be able to hold on to that new skill set that you have in terms of your endurance capacity and you getting back up your strength numbers. Not a big deal, dude. You're a gym monkey. You love, you love throw, tossing weight around. And now you are going to have greater capacity out of this. It's okay to work into specificity at certain times, especially right now if you're not going to the games and you're a competitor mm -hmm. because you are now training for 2000 and, uh, 2021. I almost said 2011. <laughs> That's how far off I am. I'm like a decade behind. Um, I, you, you sort of spoke to it, but I, the, one of the other questions I had is um, – Assuming that a lot of athletes don't have at least as m much access to heavy weight, uh, and that's that's barbell, lots of bumper plates, but that's also things like I don't know, heavy sandbags or weight fests or like all, all the fun stuff that that you know you've got there at CFNE. How would you recommend they start thinking about um, tackling their training uh, in lieu of? what would have been maybe heavier weights. In other words, should they ramp up maybe the, um, the volume? Should they ramp up however they would the intensity? Should they ramp up some other, some other aspect of their training to compensate maybe for the lighter weights or the, the lower amount of variance in the, in just kind of like the, the movements that they can tackle? It makes sense, right? You, it seems like, okay, the, the, the load's going to go down. So what we should do is increase the, um, the, the, the volume, the reps, yep. the, the amount of, um, the answer to that though is no, Okay. you don't do that. Um, if, if you do, if you have Sam Briggs do that, yep. what, what's the benefit of that? She's already the engine. She's already got the greatest stamina endurance in the sport. What's she going to gain from that at all? The answer is not to do that as the default mode. The answer to do that is, okay, you don't have the loading aspect. So let's take Sam Briggs. Everyone knows that she's not the strongest athlete. She's got a good deadlift, but she's not the strongest athlete, but she's got this insane, insane metabolic engine, right? If it's enough of an engine workout, she's going to win. So if you do what you're saying, she just, she's going to add on this like half a percent to the thing that she's already the best at. That's not going to make her that much better of an athlete. What you mm -hmm. want to do is what I said in the previous one, yep. which is identify the weakness and then bring up the volume on the weakness. So it's not just what those athletes are doing is they're trying to substitute the loading aspect. The loading thing, if you don't have the weights, you're not going to be able to make it up. You, here's what, you, what, this, what you're trying to do is you're trying to stay strong, mm -hmm. right? By increasing the volume. Well, so instead of trying to um, clean and jerk 300 pounds, what you're going to do is, I know this isn't the exact example, but instead what you're going to do is you're going to do 100 reps of grace. Mm -hmm. Like, no, that doesn't make you stronger. That's a different mechanism. That's improving your stamina. That's a different thing. That's not strength. It's, um, they're, they're two different animals. Yep. Um, what you want to be able to do there instead is don't just do that as the default, have a little higher level of thinking here and attack the weakness. Like that's what the sport is, especially for most of us that are trying to do better in the open. If with so many competitors that you're going up against, at the games, you don't get punished as much for having a weakness. You just don't because there's only maybe now more so than before because there's a hundred and something competitors. But when there was 40, mm -hmm. you having a weakness like, you know, like Brooke Hentz, like Brooke Hentz has some wheelhouses and some major, major holes, but she was super competitive yep. regardless because she could do great in some workouts, not great in others. Um, what you need to be able to do in the open though, is if you have that, like you're out of the ball game. So if you're a master's athlete looking to try to qualify for the top 200 to make the age group qualifier and your finishes are in your age group are like 11th, 19th, 2nd, 4th, and then the other one is a movement that you're not good at. Let's say you can't do double unders yep. and double unders pop up and you end up like um, 933rd, you're not qualifying. Mm -hmm. Like you, you got to be well-rounded across. Uh, this is, I'm going to say it again, like, Take a step back from what you've been doing. Don't try to hold on to the same routines. Don't have the same methodology. Instead, take this as an opportunity to eliminate a weakness. Now, here's the big one for everyone. Most CrossFitters, now I'm not, but majority, it's more than 50% are not strong runners. Mm -hmm. Like what better time than ever to become proficient at running? Yeah. Like now I get it. That's not going to show up in the open. It's probably not going to show up in some online qualifiers for sanctionals. 
But if you're the people you were talking about when you alluded to this at the beginning, the people are doing double days and kind of competitors, those people are trying to go to san- sanctioned events and try to make it to the games. Like every sanctioned event now has running. Mm-hmm. Like if they don't have running, they should not be a sanctioned event because you need I you cannot. I used to I used to run a really high level uh, event, the East Coast Championships. Yep. Um, and running was not a big component of it because we weren't trying to qualify people for the games. We we're trying to put on a show. Yep. So we didn't need to. It was more like a regional format until like True Form and Assault Runners came along and then we started doing it. Um, but like running is such a massive component to what fitness is. It's going to be tested at the games. Anybody that's putting a sanctional event that doesn't have a component of running it is really irresponsible. Mm. They all know that. Yep. So the shortcut of this is every single one's going to have running in some cap- capacity. Yeah. Spend this time getting comfortable running six miles at a time. Like you should not have to struggle to run six miles, you know, zone two, really easy heart rate, get really good at that. Said another way, um, or set in, uh, flip that around. If it's not in the endurance thing yet, maybe you have an um, endurance background, get fast. Mm. Like knock three seconds off of your 400 time. Now, if you're super competitive, you're going, what? That's impossible. You can't do that. It's not for you. You're working endurance. Yep. This is for the people that have like a, a 111 400. Like get that down to a 108. That's mm-hmm. very possible. Mm-hmm. Um, last question, maybe as we as we start to wrap up and, and you kind of alluded to it or mentioned it is uh, one of the things I was thinking about was how um, how useful, how prevalent, how valuable good routines are for athletes, especially athletes who are um, – uh, trying, trying to compete at a high level. Right. Um, uh, a lot of the athletes that I know, like their, their days, their, their weeks are built around the the hours that they spend training. And I wonder what, uh, what advice you might have for athletes who have now, you know, all of us have, but have found themselves kind of without routines or in an environment yeah. where those old routines are irrelevant for, to a large part, like how, what advice do you have for folks struggling to figure out how do I, how do I fit this thing back into my life? How do I, yep. how do I build those routines again, given that everything is different? Where do you like, where do you begin to get that sort of sense um, of regularity back into their lives so that they can continue to train at the level that they want to? Okay. Um, uh, two, po- two takes on this. The, the, um, so two pieces. The first one will be like more theoretical and mindset. The next is going to be an actionable tool. The first one is adapt and overcome. Like get over it. Like embrace the harsh reality. It's gone. You're not going to the gym. Stop the woe is me. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Adapt and overcome. It's what every single elite athlete has had to do at some point in their career. You are not special because your routine doesn't get to exist anymore. This is everyone is in the same boat. And even if they weren't, if it was just you, it's your turn to adapt and overcome. Never allow yourself in a moment to think, woe is me. To think like, oh, I don't have my routine. Oh, I can't do this. Like, just get over it and do what you can with what you got for where you are right now. If you start to feel sorry for yourself because of that, like, you got, that's awesome. It's okay. Tr- trigger, recognize it, awareness. I'm feeling sorry for myself. Be like, use it as a thing to harden yourself again. Like, David Goggins style, like just like almost like, um, like get harder for the fact that you were weak. Like, damn it. I, I just felt sorry for myself. Okay. I am never going to allow myself to do that. That is not who I am. I am not the person that feels sorry for himself. I am the person that adapts and overcomes, you know, like, just like I am the type of person that and fill in the blank to who you want to become. Um, by the way, there's, there's psychology, there's research that says, actually, it's more powerful to say you are the type of person that mm, not, to yourself. not I am. Yeah. Yeah. When you say like you're, cause you are not that voice in your head. You're actually telling the voice in your head to do something mm. different. Mm-hmm. Like you're, you're instructing you listen, you, um, Matt Fraser, when I was coaching him, um, kind of brought that's like, that's how he talks to himself mm. a lot. Um, and then in a really funny negative way. <laughs> uh, um, okay. And the next one is super tactical. It's probably not going to be the answer because we're talking about routine, yep. um, but it's probably not going to be the answer that you're expecting with this. Um, and that is 
stop making workouts up for yourself. Hmm. So there's a, uh, here's the psychology of what happens when you make up workouts for yourself. Let's say you make up a really awesome hard workout, five rounds for time, making this on the spot, but like five rounds for time, um, 20 burpees, 20 thrusters at 95 pounds, um, and 20 chest to bar pull-ups, mm -hmm. like nasty, right? A hundred reps of each of those yep. and a mile and a quarter of running, or let's say you do 800 meters of running per round, like nasty, right? Yep. 35, 40 minutes. Um, you make that workout on yourself. You're right on the whiteboard and you start the workout. Um, in the middle of round two, when you get back to those thrusters, you go, what, what's your thought process? It gets so freaking hard, right? What's your thought process? Uh, uh, I imagine like maybe I overprogram this. Yes, yeah. exactly. Maybe <laughs> I overprogram this. Yeah. So what you're thinking about is more about like, did I program this yeah. right? Is this overprogrammed? Should I switch it? If you program for yourself, I promise you that's going to be in your head. Yeah. If somebody else programs for you, and other people are doing it. So I'm saying is like get on comp train type thing, right? Like if it's not comp train, get on something else. But when that you trust, and that's the kind of key. Yeah. You're trusting. You when I'm doing those workouts, like I'm not thinking that because right. I know yeah. there is 200 other people doing the exact same workout as me right now. So instead of like maybe I have a program this, it's still going to get hard. Except what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to feel sorry for myself, and then it flips back into that. Okay. You're feeling sorry for yourself. Stop that right now. You are better than this. You are not the type of person that feels sorry for yourself. You can't program for yourself. That's it's it's such a mistake mm. because what you're doing is every single time you're giving yourself an out. And what happens is you're thinking the wrong stuff during the workout. Instead of like, how do I get better at this? How do I get faster? How do I work harder? How do I get more mentally tough and forge my, uh, my, my, my mental fortitude and grit and tenacity. You're thinking about your programming skills. <laughs> right. That's, that's not what you're supposed to be doing. That's the yeah. coach's job. Yeah. Leave that to the coach. And the second thing is if you're programming for yourself, you have no one to compare your scores to. So you're the only person in the world doing this workout right now. And there is a secret that Greg Glassman figured out. This is this is like people don't talk about this. this is the secret of people talk about constantly varied function movements point at relatively high intensity. That's what CrossFit is, right? That's the secret to this whole thing. Yep. They're right. Okay, so function movements, we get it. Everyday life, compound movements, universally found, um, natural and essential. Got it. Um, um Constant variance. Okay, we're going to run today. We're going to row tomorrow. We're going to weights, gymnastics. We're going to go long, we're going to go short. Got it. High intensity. Okay, it's working really hard, but what's the mechanism? How do we get people mm -hmm. to work out really hard? Glassman was the only one that figured this thing out. How do you get people? I'm going to ask you, Patrick. What is What did Glassman create? What is What was his tools? What did he do to get people to work hard? Uh, he, he put their names on a whiteboard. That's exactly it. A stopwatch and a whiteboard. Mm -hmm. Patrick is so freaking smart. <laughs> so yes, a stopwatch and a whiteboard will get people to put out men will die for points is the saying. It, you, you, I promise you, I promise you, you will work harder in tomorrow's workout if you have to tell me what your time was. Mm -hmm. Even if I'm not doing the workout. Yep. Just the fact that it's measurable observable, and this is what people miss, observable, repeatable data. What we're doing when we're training is science, measurable, observable, repeatable data. What people need to do is recognize that what you need to be able to do is make your results observable by other people. They have to see what you did. And when you do that, you work harder. Mm -hmm. No drill sergeant, heavy metal music, Tony Robbins, no one is going to get you the motivation that a stopwatch and a whiteboard will do. Mm -hmm. How fast you do it, post times to comments. That is the secret to intensity. And it matters because intensity is the independent variable most commonly associated with favorable adaptations. Intensity is the shortcut to getting results. Mm -hmm. Meaning the harder you work, the faster you'll see results. 
So during this quarantine time, people lose quote unquote motivation yeah. because they're programming for themselves and sec- subconsciously, they're not doing it consciously, subconsciously second guessing their coaching and programming abilities because they're, and, or what they might do is the opposite of what I said before. It's like the worst workout's too hard. I overprogrammed. The other thing is this workout was too easy. I need to do more. Yeah. And now they're overtraining. So it's like, follow a program you trust. Mm. And from there, post times to comments and you will work harder. Mm-hmm. You got to take away all the second guessing and put yourself in an environment that elicits the hard work. Mm-hmm. That's how you get motivated. It's mm-hmm. not listen to heavy metal music or meditate or um, you know, watch Miracle the night before or whatever it might be. Yeah. Although I am really enjoying watching The Last Dance. Have you seen that? No. What is that? It's a Michael Jordan. It's a oh, story. Of, yeah. No, I haven't seen the, it. The Bulls. Uh, it's it's phenomenal. Very cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've talked about the we've talked about in a number of episodes the the power and the value of the right environment, and so that's kind of what I'm hearing from uh, from the question of like, well, my routine's off. How do I kind of get myself back into it? Is is yes, the the physical environment might not be perfect, but you can still get kind of the the motivational environment if you plug yourself into yeah. the right you know, plug yourself into the right outlet again, whether that's comp train or something similar, right. And let, and let that be the, the, the kind of new virtual environment. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. All right, my man, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to be back next week and, uh, everybody stay safe, stay sane, take care. You can get every episode of chasing excellence, wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube until next time. Thank you for listening.